Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's underscore. We're going to be talking about the power of customer education to drive growth and specifically growth earlier on in the customer life cycle in the marketing and sales journey. Um, so before we dive in, we get started. Just some quick housekeeping. First of all, this webinar is being recorded. So if you want to share it with other people, you want to come back and reference it, you've got to jump off at the halfway mark for a meeting. Totally cool. We're going to record it. Um, with this new platform that we're on, you might notice it's a new new platform that we're using this month. Um, you'll actually be able to access the recording right where you are right now. Um, so as soon as we're done, it's going to transition over to the recording so you can watch it there. And we'll also have, there should be a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So as we're going, if you have questions for Chris, who's our featured speaker today, um, you can ask them there. We'll also have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, so why, what, are, what are we talking about today? Why are we talking about it? So um, earlier this year, we partnered with Forrester to conduct some research. And so we surveyed 300 customer education decision makers about what they're investing in and what their programs look like, how they've evolved over time, and more specifically, what me uh, metrics are you tracking to measure impact? And what we saw was an increase in the number of people who are looking at customer education and its role earlier in the customer life cycle. So how are people using customer education to win additional customers and to increase win rates? And, um, and so that's something that we're going to be talking about today is how can customer education be used as an acquisition channel for marketing and for sales? And there is really no better speaker to talk about this. So I'm really excited to introduce to you Chris LaDolce. Um, Chris is an advisor at SAS Academy Advisors. He was also a founding member of HubSpot Academy. So if you're like me, you know, HubSpot Academy is kind of the pinnacle of customer education. They are rocking it. They kind of almost even establish like what this is supposed to look like, what great looks like. Um, and they're using it really well for marketing and sales. But he's going to be walking through um, how he thinks about this, how he coaches customers on this as well. And so um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. And I think we're actually going to start off with a poll. So um, I'm going to launch this poll here. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about what brings you to this conversation today. All right, thank you, Shannon. So as we uh, answer this first question, we'll just pause here. Shannon, I'm curious to know, do we have our, do we want our video on or off for this? Good question. I think we'll keep videos on, yeah. Okay. All right, so you will see that poll kind of under the video on the page that you're on. So as we're learning this new channel, you're learning it with us. All right, so it looks like some people are saying they're just interested in learning more about this topic, which is totally cool. You came to the right place. Is there anybody currently using customer education as an acquisition channel? All right, I'm seeing currently putting together a strategy pitch, exploring putting together a strategy and pitch. Okay. So it looks like, Chris, we're mostly just interested in learning more. Um, so that's kind of a great place to start this conversation is, you know, what, what is this and how does it work? Absolutely. All right. Well, as that continues to come in, uh, just as a reminder, Shannon shared, there is the question area. And it sounds like I'm only seeing the deck. I think maybe we need to change the layout. How about now? Can you see myself? Can you see Chris in the video? We can see you now, yeah. Okay, awesome. All right, we got the system ready to go. Um, so let's jump right in. Thanks for those of you who used that question pane already. We're definitely gonna be using that today for conversation, for questions. Please do not hesitate to ask a question. There are no um, points for correct spelling or grammar. So if you have a question, just get it in there and we'll get started. Um, so as Shannon mentioned, one of the big areas that people are thinking about using customer education for is around winning more customers. And so I wanted to start off with three quick ways uh, that you can start helping your go-to-market team, your marketing and sales team, win more customers with any existing customer education that you already have. So here's your like super quick wins. Jot these down. We're going to start with the first one, which is to include CE benefits um, in the sales demo pitches and follow-ups. So what do I mean by that? Lots of times your sales team is on the phone pitching and selling and communicating the value of a product or service uh, that your organization sells. 
the customer education function within that conversation can be forgotten a lot of times. So when you're thinking about what is the first quick thing you can do, if you have an existing customer education program at your organization, take some time to think about where can that fit into the sales process? And we did this at HubSpot, lots of our clients do this and they actually work with sales enablement and say, hey, sales enablement, can we create one to three slides that communicates the benefit to customers or prospects who will become customers? So a good example of that would be like, you're selling a product or service and let's say it's a software service and there's three or more members of a team who are gonna be using that software. A big pain point that comes up is change management and how am I gonna get all of my team to be thinking in the right mindset about using a software, using the same verbiage, the same language to do their jobs? Customer education, right? We have a library of educational content, it might be, might be live trainings, it might be uh, courses or certifications. There's ways in which the sales team can bring in that and explain how this is gonna help their teams more quickly adopt the, a software or a product as well as help with the change management. Right, so that's a quick one that you can do. If you can get alignment with your sales team, your, your sales org, you might be saying, well, how are we going to measure that? How are we actually going to show customer education is helping? A quick way to do that, if your company is using Gong or any sales acceleration tools that are recording calls, you can hop in there and search how often or in which calls was customer education, academy, certifications, training mentioned and then look at those win rates. So for a lot of you today, you might potentially have an ability to work with the sales team and get your educational content as part of this conversation of the benefits of a prospect buying your software or service. That's the first thing. The second is this marketing page, right? Lots of times as a customer education program, as an academy, we have our page for all of our educational content, our homepage which is awesome, right? That's where you go if you are somebody who's actively looking to learn. But there isn't a website page, a page on your website that's speaking to your customer education or your academy as a product. Just like you're selling your products, your educational content is holistically or collectively also a product. And so having that page that people can find as they're navigating and learning more about your business or sales can include in follow-ups. Here's a little bit more about the value and benefits of our customer education or our academy and how it's going to help you with your change management, with getting your users ramped up and using the software and seeing success. So you can think about how can we work with marketing on that, right? How can that tie into the sales follow-ups, making sure we have a link? Hey, here's learn more about our customer education program and how it helps you adopt our software, see value. These are two quick things you can do right away um, without creating any new content. The third is a little bit more of a heavier lift but this is around actually allowing your prospects to access your customer education content. Uh, and this might be in your LMS, this might be behind a login. Um, so there could be a little bit more work here, but many times during that sales process, it's here's a link, go sign up, go take a look at all of the resources your employees are gonna have or your teams are gonna have to adopt and use this tool or this software or this product to get the value we're talking about your business needs or solve that pain point your business needs. So those are three quick ways you can do something right off the bat. No net new content creation, it's just alignment within the organization. If there's any questions around that, let me know. If this is something you're thinking about doing, shoot me a message, I'm happy to send you over like a step-by-step, -step. here's how we take this idea and actually get it implemented and all the things you need to do. But again, this isn't really about creating net new content. When we get to a long-term strategy, this is where we start thinking about how do we use educational content more strategically? How do we think about building trust in the market? How do we think about building relationships that start long before the prospect is actually going to buy? And this typically comes in the form of a course, a certification. Um, it could be a series of webinars as well. But when we're thinking about customer education, it's how can we take how we create educational content today in the form of courses, lessons, certifications, and how can we bring that from our customer base back up to the market, the industry? And what are the differences there? Oh, good question. Pam asks, quick win. Include customer education as a benefit. Does this mean free or part of a paid service? Pam, that's definitely going to be dependent on your business model. 
if you're selling your customer education, right, that's probably going to actually be part of the sales pitch um, as an additional add-on or maybe including an onboarding or free for the first six months or 12 months. There is a lot you can do there with promotions, giving discounts, or saying, hey, the first six months are free. But definitely, if you're thinking about selling the value of customer education, it's a great point to call out. If it's your customer education is free to all customers, that sales demo, those slides that the sales team are going to use, that marketing page is going to look different than if you actually have a price or a tiered pricing for your educational content. Jamie has a question as well. And this is still around the quick wins, I believe. Any advice on convincing sales that they should help boost customer ed for your paid if they're not incentivized to sell it? Jamie, great question. Um, so if you're going direct to the sales reps, right? So you kind of have a bottom-up approach or top-down approach. If you can build the relationships with sales management, sales leadership, if you can build the relationships with sales ops, um, you could potentially work with them to then require this or put this into the traditional or standard pitch deck that a sales team might use or pull from. The other way is to start from the bottom up. And I actually see that work more often than not. So here's my tip for that. If you have gone or if you have relationships or if you don't, go start building those with sales reps. Start asking around which sales reps are doing this naturally. You'll find the, the sales reps who are more consultative in nature and looking to build these relationships and show the value of your ecosystem, your company, and not just the product are probably already doing this. Uh, I don't think I've seen an instance of a business where you don't have some sales reps communicating the value of the, of the post-purchase customer education experience. Um, so I think you have a big opportunity there to, to look at your current relationships, your stakeholder relations within your business and ask, do I need to start top down or bottom up? If it is bottom up, you work with those sales reps. You talk to those sales reps. How is this helping accelerate your sales process? What are we doing here? Right, That is where you can really then start saying, okay, here's three or four people that it's working for. Here's how they're doing it. Then move up a little bit and say, hey, look, let's operationalize this. Some sales reps are doing it. Let's try to do it with everybody. Do we need a training? Do we need resources? Do we need some slides for them to pull into their deck? Um, but I would definitely think about top down, bottom up, and where you can start getting those quick wins, even if it's with one or two sales reps who are doing it, or at least willing to work with you to, to see how that could fit into the process and then report back uh, on the value that's creating in those sales conversations. We have another question here. I love this. If you have content that is not for customers, but for prospects, would you recommend keeping it ungated? I'm thinking you'd want to keep it as easy as possible to access. How do you track impact of ungated content? Shireen, that's a really good question. Um, I'll get it. I think what I'm going to do is put the table that for our Q&A section of this, because there's a lot we can go into there in terms of gating versus ungating and what that means um, from a sales process and being able to track results. Um, so we're going to pin that. It looks like we even have a pin feature here um, to prioritize that to make sure we address it in the Q&A. It's a really good question and a debate I think Shannon and I could probably have uh, for hours. So we'll definitely talk back and forth for the QA part of that. So the long-term strategy, we're gonna create educational content. We're gonna create a course, a certification, some type of educational content that's specific to industry professionals, right? Pre-sale, pre that's not gonna speak specifically to our product, right? The goal is to build trust, um, Shannon and I were talking before this, she was sharing um, a, a stat that the majority of people who are going to buy your product or service in the next 12 to 24 months aren't even actively engaged in the sales process today. But that doesn't mean we can't start building trust and educating them on how to think about managing their company, specific job or role, and how to do that with specific types of mental models, best practices, et cetera. So we keep talking about customer acquisition. How are we defining that today? This is a pretty standard definition, but it's that process of attracting new customers or clients to a business, right? usually their first purchase of a product or service. And so when we're thinking about customer acquisition in relationship to customer marketing, we have to ask ourselves, is my organization set up to support using customer education for acquisition? Right? Unfortunately, it's not as easy as creating a course or a certification 
or a cohort training or a workshop or a boot camp, and just magically all of a sudden we're generating leads and educating the market. That would be awesome if it was, but it's not. So there's some key things here as we think about using educational content in the acquisition process that we need to consider. Um, so having, having done this with multiple businesses, here are six things that are worthwhile for you to ask yourself. Uh, and an easy way to kind of grade yourself is yes to the question, no to the question, or I'm unsure. Right? And unsure isn't a bad thing. It just simply means it's something that I need to dig a little bit deeper before I can make a decision on. So the first is, is your organization strategically investing in category creation or redefinition? What does that mean? We want to ask ourselves, our product or service, is, are we trying to create a net new category for that? Or are we selling a product within an existing category? And if we're selling it within an existing category, how are we redefining or repositioning ourselves? Most businesses have an idea or an approach to this, but whether or not they're investing in communicating that out through their marketing materials, through how they sell, through their customer education, that strategic investment is important because category creation doesn't happen overnight. Generating leads can happen overnight or can happen in a monthly campaign. When we're thinking about using educational content right, to build trust, build relationships, build long-term engagement with future customers, it's going to take time. So if the business doesn't have that long-term mindset of part of our acquisition process is not just lead gen, but it's that awareness and trust building for future purchasers, it's going to be harder to communicate the value and why we should invest in something like customer education, courses, certifications for the industry. So that's the first question to ask ourselves. Chris, can I jump in just on Please. the category creation? Because I think HubSpot's a great example, right? So the main certification that people will sign up for in HubSpot Academy is for inbound marketing. And if you work in marketing, you know, inbound marketing is kind of just how we do marketing now. But when HubSpot Academy started talking about this, defining and teaching inbound marketing, that was not how marketing worked, right? Marketing was largely out of home, traditional print, billboards, things like that, PR, and less digital. And um, and really that, I think a lot of marketers now will talk about that, like attract, um, convert, and actually now I'm not going to remember the whole, the whole acronym. Well, there's be multiple versions. Attract, engage, delight is the current engage. one. Okay. Yeah. But that, that like framework was something that you were, you were changing how people thought about something because it wasn't how they were used to doing things. And I think HubSpot Academy did a great job in really raising up, a, not just a new generation of marketers, but transitioning how we even think about marketing in the first place. Like a lot of how we do marketing today really comes from that inbound marketing philosophy. Really great point. And it kind of highlights number three. So we'll just skip to that while we're on this topic around does your organization have a, a viewpoint or a framework or a methodology that communicates this category you're trying to create, this redefinition? That's super important. And Shannon mentioned you know, HubSpot and HubSpot's methodology or flywheel, but that's not specific to HubSpot. If you were to go to gong.com, their methodology or framework looks more like a stacked cube, but it shows how you're going to use sales acceleration and their tool set to grow your business or to close more deals or more sales. If you go to Circle, community management software, you're going to see the same thing, how you think about building that community, community and extracting value out of that community. So having some type of framework and methodology is gonna be really helpful to Shannon's point when you go to market with educational content and you're not just like, here's what you need to do, here's what you need to know, here's the best practice, but you're taking a step back and saying, look, there's tons of marketing tools out there Here's how to think about doing marketing in an educational way where you're adding value first, where you're not interrupting people, right? The inbound message. And now that you can see how we're thinking about that, here's all the tools and everything else you need to consider. So that's a, a question to ask yourself. And I'd love to know in the chat pane, does anybody here today, can they, can they recall quickly or point to um, a framework or a methodology or some type of graphic or visual that communicates how their business thinks about their positioning in the market or how to do a job with their software. And no's are just as good as, as yeses, but I'm just curious to get a, a quick pulse check when we're ta talking about things like frameworks and methodologies. Does anybody have that? And you can just 
and ask that as you would in the question pane. And the question again is, do we have, does anybody have a methodology or framework or something that they could create a course around that holistically explains the company's you know, viewpoint or approach on how to do X, Y, and Z? Okay, as those come in, we're going to keep moving on. The next big one is, is your marketing team already producing valuable content that's educational in nature? This is a big one. Right? Your company might be creating blogs, ebooks, templates, guides, podcasts, newsletters, webinars, you know, the list goes on. But we want to be asking ourselves, is our organization already educating the market? Or is this going to be a completely new motion? Maybe we have a blog and it's mostly announcements. Maybe we have one or two eBooks. Right? If your company has a, your marketing team has a really good motion for how they're bringing educational content to market today, adding on or coming out with a new offering, which is a course or a certification, is going to be a much lighter lift than the marketing team having to really think and develop a new process for how they're going to market an educational resource like a certification or a course. So this is another big one of like, if you're thinking yes or no, is our company ready? Thinking about what do those processes look like today? Five is, do sales already have a playbook for selling content leads? A content lead comes in from an ebook, from a template, from a guide. What does that sa initial sales process look like that's different from when a salesperson is requesting a demo? And then the last, does your organization have the ops team in place to integrate a new lead source? Right, so you have an LMS, someone signing up for the LMS, they're not a customer. That lead comes in. How is that getting passed over to the CRM? How is that getting rotated in the sales process? How is it getting assigned to the right sales rep based off of territory or based off of uh, business size? Right, these are all things that when you think about creating educational content, a certification, a course for the industry that can get overlooked. And the last thing we, we really want to make sure we don't do, which I unfortunately do see a lot, is that we create a course, we say we're ready to go, and then it sits there. It's not used by marketing. It's not used by sales. So we have this great resource to educate the market, but we have no way to get it in front of the right people. We have no way for the business to benefit from it. So super important as we think about the readiness of our organization to adopt customer education. And Jamie, I just want to give you a shout out. Thanks for sharing. Atlassian recently acquired Loom and Loom is definitely a category creator and has a point of view on async video work. And there's even a link there too, as an example. So that's a great one. Thank you for sharing that, Jamie. Super important when you're creating your educational content for the industry that you have some framework, some map, something to bring all of these different things that you'll be teaching together. Okay, we were looking at it from the business perspective. Now we're gonna ask ourselves, is my customer education program ready to support an acquisition motion strategically? And what are the things we need to discuss there? So again, for customer education, how we're gonna define it is it's simply a programmatic approach to educating and inspiring customers to take an action, change a behavior in service of obtaining an organizational goal, a professional goal, using a product or service. So what is customer education for acquisition? There's a slight change here, right? There's still this programmatic approach, unlike let's say a webinar where we're not actually tracking what were the behavioral changes. With customer education, we at least wanna be asking ourselves in the acquisition process, where did we educate, did we inspire our future customers to take an action? Right? That might be within your product, that might not be. It might be harder to track. We might not be able to track it, but we're still thinking about creating this educational content in a way that we have specific goals that we're tracking and learning objectives that we're building to. Right? And those are the two characteristics that I'd say are different between content that is educational, your podcasts, your webinars, your eBooks, all super valuable and helpful for customers. But when we're thinking about educational content, in the form of a certification or a course, we're defining those learning objectives. And then we're having a way to assess those learning objectives. And they'll look different for our industry professionals, the prospects than they will for our customers, 
but we're still always starting off from that place of we've identified a way to educate and inspire a group of people. And here is how we're going to understand if what we created was effective to educate and inspire them to go take action. Because without that, it's just another piece of content. The next thing we want to look into is the levels of customer education readiness. So I would say the average customer education program today is a series of courses, certifications, possibly cohort trainings, instructor-led trainings, possibly in-person trainings. And it's focused on, here's how to use the product. And if you have that today, like pat on the shoulder, chip on the shoulder, you're feeling good about it. Right? Getting that stood up is not easy. We have that. But when we say, okay, with that approach that exists today, we're not really ready to now all of a sudden start thinking about how do we create educational content to educate the market? It's going to be a lot of operational changes and a different approach to the content that we're creating. We might be using the same development process, but what we're, the output is going to be much different. Now, if you're in this, I would say, good bucket, this is the customer education program today that's thinking about it's not just about teaching somebody what to do in the product, but it's a teaching them how to do their job well using that product or software. It's an example of that would be, here's what to do to build a landing page. Probably all familiar with landing pages. Shannon built one for this, we filled it out. Right? What you do in a software to do that. But now it's, here's how you do it. What are the best practices of building a landing page that's high converting? So now this user isn't just learning where to click, but they're being reminded and taught around the best practices to optimize the number of people who are going to actually fill out that landing page. Now we're helping them do their job better. This is a place where we can start saying to ourselves, wait a second, we have some industry content ready to go. We have some industry content that we could pull out and repurpose in a different course. We already have some existing assets. That's pretty exciting. And then that third level where it's like, you are ready to go is when we're taking the approach of, yes, we want to empower our users to do their job well using the product, but our mindset is even one step further. We don't want to just empower our users to use the software well. We have tasked ourselves on our customer education team to create transformative educational experiences, simply meaning by completing these courses and taking the recommended actions and suggestions and using the software, I see meaningful impact to my career. Maybe it's a promotion, maybe it's a raise, maybe it's a new job, maybe it's a course, a change of course of career. The business is growing exponentially. I've had an impact on whatever my metrics are above and beyond what was expected. This is the mindset we can have when we start thinking about creating educational content that doesn't just exist to generate a lead, but exists to build trust, to build a relationship. For someone to say, that course that I took changed the trajectory of my career or my life. And if you do a quick Google on something like this, you'll find podcasts, blog articles about folks who engaged with HubSpot Academy content, a course, a certification, and the impact that had over their lifetime or over their a certain period of their career. Um, and we have a live example today. So Shannon, I'm going to call on you here. Can you just share your, your experience um, having consumed educational content courses uh, through HubSpot Academy in the, uh, you know, probably what, 10 years ago now, but what that meant for the transformation and growth in your career. Yeah, I was telling Chris before our call that I, I had no formal training, right? I don't have a degree in marketing. I didn't have formal training. A lot of this was self-taught, learn as you go, model after other people. And my first introduction to really any kind of formal training on marketing was HubSpot Academy and learning inbound marketing and going through the content marketing certification and sales enablement certification, and email marketing certification, which gave me more of a framework. Right. So some of these things I was doing, but like I didn't totally understand how to talk about what I was doing. So it gave me language for that. And I was telling Chris, I, I was the 
owner of our HubSpot agency partner certification. Um, and I had a lot of like job outreach recruiters reach out because of my HubSpot certification. So definitely um, played, played a role in my career. And I know that's true for some of the people calling in today too, that you have certifications that you offer to your, whether customers or prospects that are actually really advantageous to their career growth and development, whether it's giving them language to talk about the work that they do, or if it's um, actually that certification is something they can put on their resume that's going to open a door. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and absolutely. And that's what that's the mindset we want to have. And so we were asking ourselves, do we have that mindset today? If not, what is that mindset set shift going to look like within our organization? Because these leads or these folks that are engaging with this content, they might be coming out of college. They might not be a decision maker today, but building that trust their advocacy of what they've learned, they're sharing. These are all things that are going to build over time through the awareness and hopefully help contribute to any type of shift in the market or category creation your product sits in. All right, so, so that's kind of high level. Now we're going to start zooming in and say, okay, what does this mean for the actual customer education content? So here is essentially Kirkpatrick's model, level one, two, three, and four. Someone consumes training, they have a reaction. They've learned, they have behavioral changes, right? There's results, meaningful results for the business based off of what they're doing differently after taking this training or this course. And then that last piece is, can they point back to that experience with your educational content and say, that was a driver. That was a reason why I was able to grow in my career, regardless of your software. That is why I was able to land a job because I was able to speak to what are the changes that are happening in the industry? How should I be thinking about doing my job well? That level five is what we're going for. Even if it's not happening for every user, which it never will, that's the mindset we need if we're going to build an educational product, a certification, a course, a lesson, whatever it may be for the industry. That's the goal. So how do we now start breaking down and thinking about, okay, that's the goal, Chris. Great, that sounds all fine and well. How do we start thinking about the content and what it looks like to get there? So I always love to use Simon Sinek's golden circle. Right? I think he came out with this in the early 2000s, but it's essentially this idea of three, three layers. Right? And that what layer is what most average customer education programs do. They're educating customers on those processes and steps, standard operating procedures that somebody must do to use the software. Assuming that they know everything they need in their job or their role. That next level, that, that good content, um, it, that's part of a you know, good educational program is saying, look, you probably know most of what you need to do in your job, but let's be honest, who's ever taken a role and knows how to do everything well that's part of those job responsibilities? Probably not many of us, right? So we're always learning and things are always changing and we need to always be staying up with times. So this is where those strategies, those mental models, those best practices come into play. So if you're sitting here today and you're saying, oh yeah, we, we definitely teach to strategies, mental models, best practices, or our marketing team has a library of, of this type of content, or the blog is filled with it. And now we're saying, okay, this is good. This is content that we could potentially use. And then that why piece goes back to the methodology, the framework. Why should somebody care about this? Why is this going to actually drive meaningful impact to the business of the customer or to the business of a prospect? So these are those three levels. Now we say, okay, let's bring it even more further down into this idea of content itself. And what does the content look like in more of a structured way? So here's a, a, a rather large graphic. So I'm going to break it down. But we talked about the why, how, and what. We've talked about this idea of a philosophical approach, a unique view on the market. Right? Loom has a unique view on how to use video for work. Your company might have that unique view published on your website. It might be part of your sales decks, but you have that philosophical approach to how to do something a certain way. Right? And then we have hopefully a methodology. This is great. If we have those two things already, it might be included in our content or that might be content we need to create. And then for each area of a methodology, whether that's how to attract customers, how to engage those prospects and how to delight those customers, or whatever your methodology may be for the type of business you're in, there's a series of pieces of content around educational content. 
right? So, so educational, sorry, best practices. So you have industry knowledge, best practices, trends, all of these things are going to fall into these buckets. Right? And then we have our, you know, technical product, product skills. And then we have, you know, tactics, SOPs, and things like that. Great for customer education program. If we're trying to create that great or that, you know, really good customer education program, that's going to help users, not just use the software well, but transform their businesses and their careers. But we're saying, Chris, we don't want to teach prospects how to use our software because they're not interested in that. They're just interested in how they can do their job better in the industry. So that's where we say, okay, we're going to pull out that what content on how to use the software, right? What you need to do in the software. Here are the procedures you need to take. And we're also going to change the product knowledge and say, you know what? Instead of here's what you need to do in our software, we're going to say, here are some examples of this done well. Here are some use cases of how folks actually executed using the industry knowledge and best practices aligned with their methodology, the methodology and philosophical approach to our business to be successful. Right, so when you're thinking about your content arch architecture today, the question is, is my content modular? Do I have any existing content around <clears throat> industry knowledge and best practices in my content or in my business that I can repurpose? And then do I have a way to bring it all together, to tell that story in one slide or visual, and then dive into each of these topics to educate my users? This is the second to last slide in terms of thinking about the readiness of your program. Um, so when we think about what we call the Academy Program Matrix, it's essentially looking at how you operationalize your program so that it can scale. Right? Let's say today you're creating educational content for customers. Your state, you have stakeholders, you have your tech stack, the users you're enabling, marketing and distribution, operations and development, your leadership and management. And that all is in service of creating these educational products. If you're looking to create a customer education resource, a certification or a course or a lesson for the industry, that stakeholder group is going to need to expand significantly. Right? We're talking about working with sales and marketing in a completely different way, potentially even finance if there's some paid portion of this content. How you're going to lead a team that's focused on now not just customers, but the industry and prospects, your leadership style is going to have to change and your focus on how you're going to manage that team is going to change. How you develop that content, is it net new content? Because if it's net new content, that's going to be a lot more work than if you can repurpose existing content. That's why the modular approach is, approach is so important. Right? The marketing and distribution, is that going to be on your team to do? Are you going to get a head count from the marketing team? Are you going to get budget for that? So when you're thinking about the actual operations of like, we can create the content, but how do we actually develop that in a way that's operationalized and we can go to our sales and marketing team and say, here's how much it's going to cost us to create a course like this. And let's see the impact it has on generating leads short term, but keeping in mind, there's a lot of value in the brand awareness and the trust we're building <clears throat> over time as well. So use the Academy Program Matrix, or if you have a way that you think about the different functions of running your customer education team, ask yourself, this is what it looks like today. If I start creating content for industry professionals, what is going to change? What more do I have to do? What overlap is there? And we want to be able to get to a place where creating this educational content is essentially repurposing as much of the educational content from your customer education for your industry education. Okay, as we wrap up here before we get to Q&A, <clears throat> a couple common roadblocks um, that I see regularly when trying to use customer education to assist with acquisition. The first is op operations. Can we get buy-in and commitment from the operations team to build any nece necessary integrations into your CRM or your sales tool. Also with payment, if there's a payment aspect to the customer education that you're trying to sell into the industry. This is a really important thing to, to keep in mind. It's one thing to have the educational content live. It's another thing to be able to register a lead for someone to be able to sign up for that, for that lead then to go into your CRM, for that CRM then to assign it to a sales rep based off of 
territory, business size, et cetera. And what does that lead rotation look like? There's a lot there. So making sure you're aligned with ops before you invest time to create this content. The second is marketing. Marketing's got a lot to do. They have a number usually on their head, number of leads generated. This idea of long-term market category creation, really thinking about building trust prior to your prospect ready to be for, ready to purchase, that's a strategic mindset of your business, right? So if your, your business doesn't have that strategic mindset, know that it's gonna take a lot more work to get that commitment from marketing to say, you know what? We're gonna spend some time promoting this course or certification instead of this webinar or instead of this ebook that we know if we run a certain amount of uh, dollars in ads for, it's gonna generate X amount of leads and those leads are gonna close at Y rate. So there's a lot there we need to think about prior to then just jumping in and creating the content. And the last is the sales, right? The lack of training on how to sell a lead generated from a course or certification. Right? The consultative approach of that conversation is the sales rep in a space, do they have the situational fluency? Do they understand the industry, the company that they're speaking to, and how this educational content is gonna help them be successful with or without your product or service? So those are the common roadblocks to keep in mind and ensure that you've addressed prior to saying, we're gonna create an industry certification or course to educate the market. As we wrap up here, I, I just want us all to take kind of a, an, a, a thought or do a thought exercise on today. Is your customer education program positively or negatively impacting your acquisition efforts? And will that change if you create a course of certification for the industry at large? So what do I mean by this? Brand awareness. Your business might have a great brand awareness. People might love the brand of your business. When they come to take your educational content post sales, does that experience with your educational products improve that brand loyalty and affinity? Or is it actually not meeting the expectations of customers and hurting that brand loyalty and affinity? Right. This, is a, this is a really important question to ask because I've seen it go both ways. I've also seen businesses who don't really have any brand loyalty or brand awareness. And even though there's a fantastic educational product, whether it's a certification or um, a course, it goes live to the market. But there's no existing trust within the market for that business. So that certification, as great as it is, takes a lot of energy and effort to get those first couple hundred or more people into it. Right. So there's this aspect of where does your business sit, its brand sit today? How well, how efficient is it at generating leads, at nurturing those leads? These are all important aspects to consider and asking yourself, are you going to be having, are you going to be adding value to or taking away value from your existing brand awareness, brand loyalty, and brand affinity? All right. This is a, a good screenshot or something to look back on. So we won't talk through it all, but it's all going to be about getting buy-in for your customer education um, for marketing, right? How are you going to get buy-in from all the different stakeholders? Now, this is more than the content. This is the stakeholder relations are going to be the, the make or break of being able to roll this out. So think about your position in the organization. Think about who you have relationships with today within the organization, who your boss and your boss's boss, if there are bosses and boss's bosses for you, what is that? What are those relationships like? Can we go to marketing? Can we go to sales? Can we even have that conversation today? Or do we need to start much further back, right? So for those of you who said you're exploring a pitch or some of you said you're actively building a pitch, these are the questions we wanna be asking ourselves, mapping out those stakeholders. That's number three that I'm calling out here. We won't touch on the other four today, uh, but make sure you're really taking an in-depth look of those stakeholders because it doesn't matter how great your educational content is. You could create the best certification in the world, the best course in the world. If you're unable to get the buy-in from your organization to help you bring that to market, it's all for naught. Okay. 
So you can share your, your feedback with this um, QR code. You can also do it right within the platform, I believe, Shannon. Um, we do have some questions pinned, but I'll turn it over to you first if you have anything you'd like to share before we get into Q&A. Yeah, so this is my, my monthly plug to go ahead, scan the QR code, um, type in the chat below you or at the end of the webinar, just share your feedback, right? Because underscore is for you. We want to make sure that the content is, is what you're interested in, that we know it's top of mind for you. Um, I'm also going to um, put in, you'll see a little display underneath your video here, a link to the Forrester report, right? So I shared some of that data earlier, um, but I've had a few people reach out and this is actually the data that they use to make the business case for customer education at their company. So I remember like making the case for customer education at one company and I use the 2019 version of this report. Um, so you can get the 2024 data there, um, use that to, to make the case um, for customer education. Okay, but we're going to move to Q&A. So go ahead, also at the bottom of your screen, you can add um, some questions. We're going to answer some questions and then we'll kind of wrap up um, and thank Chris for, for sharing. But um, I have been enjoying this. Oop, I closed the questions for a sec. Um, maybe let's start with, uh, Pam had a question and I'm going to go back to the slide here because um, this platform lets me do that. Um, <clears throat> okay. So this slide here, if we look at how do you measure customers or learners achieving that level five transformation? Um, so Chris, how have you have you measured that impact, right? Because we usually have metrics at each stage of this Kirkpatrick model. But if we're adding this transformation top component, how would we measure success at that level? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's definitely no easy way, of course, to have a, a metric that can that can tie into your product usage. Right. So for those of you who are asking, like, what are we talking about metrics and results? Typically with reaction, right? Did people watch, take the certification? Did they give a thumbs up, a thumbs down, five out of 10, 10 out of 10 NPS, right? The learning are those types of things like your assessments to assess, did they learn what was taught in the course? The behavioral change typically is with software companies, is the software being used more or less based off of the course they took? The results, which is actually also really hard for most businesses to track is those behavioral changes, right? Now that they're using the software in a different way based off of their learnings, is that helping the business achieve the outcomes that were promised in that sales process in the pitch for why this software or this service is helpful, right? So ideally we can track results, that's tricky. But then when we get to the transformation, Pam's asking like, how do we actually know someone's life has been transformed? How do we know they've gotten a promotion from it? 99.9% .9 of the time, we're not going to be able to track that. How we do track that, how we track that at HubSpot, there's a couple of things. The first is we would reach out to people one to three months after they took the certification and ask them what they're doing differently after taking the course and have those differences in their behaviors change the results. Then we'd have another email that went out six months or so after that would follow up and ask basically how are things going and from there we would if they responded we would open a conversation up and that's where we started to get these folks coming back to us and saying hey this is what's happened to my life i got a new promotion i got a new job i'll always remember one i've i've been able to grow my business enough where i can now send my children to visit their grandparents in europe for the first time Right. That just made all of those, those sleepless nights creating educational content and figuring out how to get it out there worth it. Um, so Pam, definitely no easy plug and play. How are we going to track that? But it doesn't mean from a mindset perspective, we shouldn't be approaching this content and this education that we're creating from a place of we're here not just to tell someone how to do something or assess that someone remembers something, but to say our true motivation and goal is customer education professionals pre-sale or post-sale, should be asking ourselves, what do the folks who are trusting us with their time to learn something need to not just be able to do something differently or get a result, but how can we be a driving force in the success of their career? And what does that mean from a business perspective of trust, loyalty, and advocacy? Um, so unfortunately, there's no easy way to track it, but that's like the mindset or approach um, that we take. I like that idea of having 
those emails built in, because I think a lot of this is qualitative and you're hearing back from people, which can often just kind of be happenstance. We're hoping that people reach out to us, which I know like people have used our content to do that, right? They've used our content to um, learn new skills and then earn promotions. And sometimes you hear about that and sometimes you don't. Um, so I like the idea of actually building that into the life cycle. Um, maybe let's go back to Shireen's question about gating versus mm -hmm. ungate. So um, first of all, let's talk about what a gate is, because that's a very marketing term. Um, yeah. What does it mean to gate content? Um, and does all content need to be gated? Yeah. So in the context of marketing, typically that means, do you need to share some information to get the offer behind a form? So a gate is essentially a stopgap where it's like, you need to give us something to get what we're going to give you. Um, and typically that looks, that comes in the, in, uh, in the experience of a form, right? You give us information, you click download, you click submit, you click login, you click sign up and behind that paywall or behind that gate, if it's not paid, you get that free resource. And so I think probably all of us have gone through that experience before. And I believe what Shireen is asking is, should we create that gate or should we allow someone just to show up into the customer education experience and take that course for free and just engage with that content? Um, your website pages are a great example of ungated content. Your eBooks that require a form to get that content is a great example of gated content. And I know Shireen was mentioning how do you track impact specifically if it's ungated. And um, I think it's worth noting that that you can partially gate content. And I'm a big fan, especially for education purposes, to partially gate content. Um, I don't know how many of you have filled out a form expecting one thing and then finding garbage content on the other side uh, has happened, right? It happens to us all. And so sometimes like a partial gate means I can start to consume, right? I can start to consume content, read, um, see, is this answering my question? Is this useful? Is this helpful content? And then if I think that it is, then I can then provide my information to get access to more. And you can do that too with courses where people can start to engage with a module, a lesson within your course, um, start to take that content. And then if they want to, let's say, track their progress or save where they left off, then they would be prompted to create an account um, in your learning management system. But it is hard, right, to track their progress in a course if, if they're not logging into anything. Um, and that's where I think it's really important to have a value proposition for your learning. So um, I know like HubSpot Academy's page, um, we'll say it's kind of like your go-to resource, right? This is the place where you go to learn. And so they're making, I think you want to do that, like make a case, why would you create an account, right? Because that is a layer of, of friction. Um, and I know we had a conversation at a roundtable a couple months ago about um, tracking impact, like, do we need to, right? Do we need to track everything? Is it more beneficial to us to be able to track their progress in something? Or is it more beneficial to us to start providing them that content and that value? Um, and there's there's trade-offs. So I don't know that there's one right answer 100% of the time. Um, so hopefully that was helpful, Shereen, in your, your question. Um, but something to think about too, in terms of like, do you completely gate content? Is it completely ungated? Or can you partially gate content? Asking those questions. Um, of your le or your learning management system. I love that partially gating, right? It's almost like that that fr the free trial of the content um, before you put your information in. Um, the one other thing I'll add, Shereen, is from a marketing perspective, um, your analytics, your web tracking. So if you have this in an unlogged in state, being able to track, um, you know, of course the cookies, which is getting harder, but typically you can track your, you know, your first touch source. Right. So what is the first part of your web domains they landed on and if they engaged in that content pre-sale? Um, so from a marketing analytics tracking perspective, there's definitely things that you can look at from the pages that your educational content is on and did prospects consume that prior to purchase. Right. That's, of course, the cookie opt in and what that looks like. Uh, but I, we do have clients who put a lot of energy and effort into the UTM tracking parameters. Again, this is more marketing, uh, but looking at who is actually consuming those pages, if they've ever downloaded a form and those cookies have gone into their CRM. If not, you can at least still show number of views right, to that content and compare that to other marketing resources. 
I'm taking some notes because there's there's so many follow up conversations that we could have here. And maybe you could actually talk about um, this term that we've been hearing. And I know you're using this with our, our kind of shared customer impact dot com is this idea of an education qualified lead. What is that? You know, what does that mean um, to have a, an education qualified lead? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, so when we look at a sales process for a product that requi typically requires um, a sales rep, requires some education around process change and how you're going to use that software, a lot of that sales process is educating the prospect on how to think about this product or service, how to think about it fitting into their current workflows and work streams. What are the differences? What are the trade-offs going to be? A lot of that typically happens in sales calls, sometimes over three, six, nine, 12 months, sometimes over a couple of weeks. And so when you look at how can you move those one-on-one -on -one conversations with sales reps and use educational content to address these concepts ahead of those calls, we can do that with educational content, a lot of the structure that we talked about today. So when we think about an education qualified lead or an academy qualified lead, it's this idea of how are we able to educate this user uh, or this prospect before they purchase. And once they sign up for this course and complete the certification or complete the course, we now know, because we've been tracking those outcomes and all of those things, we now know that they are an educated lead. They understand our approach, our philosophical approach. They understand how we approach this with our product or software. Um, and there's hopefully a methodology they, they understand. So it's this idea of passing a lead to sales. That's not just like they download an ebook, but they engaged. And if that course is an hour, we now know this company is engaged for over an hour with our brand. That's a lot of time for anybody to commit. Right. And so when we think about an education qualified lead, it's this idea that we are educating a user, stamping that that, that user has been educated and being able to pass it off to sales with sales having this understanding that the person I'm talking to already knows all of these things that I typically spend one, two, three sales calls with getting them up to speed on. So this is a sales acceleration or shortening that sales time by doing the education one to many ahead of time with educational content. And I would encourage people to, if you're if you're interested in learning more about that, you can look into lead scoring. So lead scoring is a way that that marketing teams will track activities that people have done, right? So did they view the pricing page of our website? Did they view the demo page? Did they request a demo? Um, did they read content, download an ebook or a report? And each of those is assigned a score, a value that we say, okay, we think it's worth this many points, um, but because it shows a certain amount of interest that someone has maybe in your product or your service. And so as your lead score increases, there eventually becomes a threshold where we say, we're going to send this over to sales. So I actually did this with, with a previous company. We, you know, had, a, had customer education program and um, we had a ton of content, learning content and content marketing content and established a lead scoring methodology where we incorporated education content. Um, as part of that. And so we were then able to track. Um, and I think it was something like 20 times more likely to convert if they hit our lead scoring threshold. So instead of sending every single lead um, to the sales team who's downloaded a piece of whatever or taken a course, right? We all know sometimes you read content, you download content, you take a course and you have no intention of buying the software ever. And that's fine. Like we should all expect that. Um, but there is a certain amount of engagement and activity that might indicate this person is more interested. And um, so you can look into lead scoring and your marketing teams will know about this as well um, and be able to help you um, implement that if that's something that they want to incorporate into their marketing. Um, I know we're coming up on time. I put a little like announcement. It should be right underneath your video, but I'm going to go ahead uh, and let you know that next month um, our webinar is going to be on executive priorities for customer and partner education. We're going to be digging into the data from a recent um, uh, research survey that we did with 150 customer and partner education and enablement executives. And we're going to give a readout of that. Um, but I want to thank you, uh, Chris, for joining us today. I also popped his LinkedIn into the announcement there too. Like go connect with him on LinkedIn, follow him on LinkedIn. Um, go check out SAS Academy Advisors because they have a lot of great resources, templates, blogs, things like that, that you can engage with. Um, a lot ungated. You can just go check it out. 
um, but a lot of great resources there. But thank you, Chris, for coming and, um, and educating us on the power of customer education in customer acquisition. And thank you to everybody who joined us today um, for just being here, asking great questions um, and being interested in learning more about this. Yeah, it was a fun time. Thank you all. If you have questions, of course, let me know. And let's go generate some leads for the sales team. Awesome. We'll catch you all next month. Bye, everybody. Bye.